hello everybody and welcome to our first lecture in the Fungus Among Us lecture series. My name is Taylor and I am one of the student ambassadors with Oregon State uh, College of Forestry. And we are so excited to kick off this series today and so, so grateful to have you with us. Before we begin, uh, we would like to acknowledge that Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon is located within the traditional homelands of the Mary's River or Mpinafu Band of Kalapuya. Following the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855, Kalapuya people were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon. Today, living descendants of these people are a part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. And with that, let's get started with our first lecture. So today, joining us is Dr. Jesse Euling. Dr. Euling is an assistant professor in the Botany and Plant Pathology Department at Oregon State. And together with her lab, she's focused on studying bacterial fungal interactions, specifically how mechanisms of bacterial endosymbionts of fungi interact with their hosts. Dr. Euling will be discussing two topics tonight, endosymbiont and fungal relationship, as well as fungal infections. And we just want to say to begin, uh, please save any of your questions that you might have for the end of the lecture, as we will have some time for a Q&A when we're done with uh, the lecture. And so with all of that, would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Jesse Euling to the lecture series. Thank you guys so much for the invitation to participate. It's really an honor to join you here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right. Are you seeing the slides? Oh. Are we good on the slides? Yes, we can see. Uh, OK, great. Thanks. Okay. Um, so I'm just thrilled to be here. This is such a cool idea. I want to give the organizers a shout out for putting this together. And, and they did a great job advertising it as well. So thank you, everyone, for attending today. Um, I'm Jesse Euling. I'm new in the botany and plant pathology department for about the last year or so. And I thought uh, before I get into my talk that's based on the research of my lab, I would just tell you a little bit about how I got into mycology. Um, so I'm from Boise. I grew up in Idaho and have been a longtime lover of plants and, and fungi. Um, and I've, I've really been a naturalist and um, I've worked hard in my life to, to study plants and make a career out of mycology, but my advice to any of the students out there is really follow your heart and believe in um, the circumstances that bring you to the opportunities you get. Um, studying at OSU and other land grant institutions is, has played a really important role for me and we're lucky to be in the mycological community here at OSU. Um, I have a couple of roles here. So I curate the fungal collection in our herbarium, which is essentially like a dried mushroom library. Um, researchers from around the world and you, if you're interested, can take out loans from our fungal collection. I also teach mycology and fungal genomics, and I'm going to give some plugs for my courses and tell you a little bit more about them. And then I also run a research lab. So our research is focused on essentially how fungal symbioses evolve. So fungi interact with all sorts of organisms, and we like to think about um, three angles. So I'm going to tell you about two of them today. We think a lot about plant fungal interactions in the context of forest health. So plants that are associated with roots of forest trees, uh, trading nutrients and things. We also think a lot about human health and how fungi um, have gained the ability over time to inhabit the human body, the lungs and the skin and, and other parts of our bodies for better or for worse. And then lastly, about fungal bacterial interactions or what I like to call the fungal microbiome. And this is really about bacteria living inside of the cells of fungi. So much like the bacteria that live in our gut, where we have very recently learned that fungi actually have bacteria inside their cells that impact the ways that they function in their health and, and physiology. So I'm going to tell you two stories today, one about valley fever and one about the fungal microbiome or fungal endosymbionts. Um, but I just wanted to point out that the talk today is really forward looking. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about previous work that we've done, but mostly it's about where we want to go. And I hope that you'll join us either in class form or if you're an undergrad looking for research experiences, you might apply to work in the lab. So story one is about human fungal interactions and really the focus is on the disease valley fever. 
So valley fever is caused by a fungus in the genus Coccidioides. Um, it is a disease that people get when they breathe in spores uh, from desert soils. So you can see that the fungus, here's the life cycle, the fungus has several phases. It's growing as a filament in the soils and producing these arthroconidia or asexual spores. And these are what get swept up into the wind and inhaled by mammals, all sorts of mammals, but the focus here is humans. Um, once they're in the human body, they use cues like temperature to transition into other spore forms like spherules and endospores. And these go on from the lungs and, um, and some unlucky individuals they go on to colonize the spine and also the brain and people can die. People do die from valley fever. It's a very serious infection, but it's curious because not everybody dies. Most people, some people, their immune system will recognize this pathogen and, and elicit a, a proper response. And some people get really sick. So this is a question. One of the open questions is how can we control this fungus and why some people get very sick and others don't? There's been a lot of thought on the human side. Maybe it's differences in our genomes that dictate the outcome of that interaction. But I'm focused more on the fungal side, looking at population genomics to study these organisms. Where is valley fever? Valley fever is in the desert. So in the United States, you can see it's really centered in the Southern Central Valley and uh, parts of Arizona, New, New Mexico, Texas. It does go down into Mexico and Central America, but it's really in this desertous region in the Southwest. And you'll notice a little blip up here in Southern Washington. It was recently um, discovered in a somewhat gnarly accident. A, a gentleman was riding a dirt bike and tipped over, had a spill and got a raspberry on his skin where they isolated it, so cultured fungal material and then matched it by genome sequencing to soil, to an isolate that they cultured from soil. And we now know that coccidioides is in uh, eastern Washington here. So I think there's a chance, a fairly good chance that it's in eastern Oregon. And I'd like to address that in my current and upcoming research. And so just a word on where coxy is now, valley fever or, or coccidioide, where it is now, where it might be in the future. Um, this is my colleague, Morgan Gorris et al. And she's a climate modeler. So what she's done is taken a look at uh, the temperatures and precipitation across the US and mapped, this is relatively recently, where it's the hottest and where you get the most rainfall, and then how that's changed over the past 10, 15, 20 years and predicted in the future how that's going to continue to change. And the short answer is the, the area where coxie can live now in the desert soils is going to expand rapidly and, and coxie is going to travel with that expansion. So here's a similar map showing the exact same thing. The green is where we know coxie is now. There's that little Southern Washington blip I was telling you about. The red is suitable habitat for coxie currently, and it's only gonna get worse as things warm up. So I also grabbed a screenshot of Google Earth here. Um, we all know that this stretch of, of desert region in Eastern Washington and Oregon is contiguous with the east side of the Sierra. So this is all pretty much coxie country. and. Um, I'm hoping that in the future lab can document the presence of coxie in Oregon. It does hit many mammals, so humans aren't the only ones. And by monitoring uh, populations like farm animals and dogs, we can get a handle on where this fungus is and, and then study it to try to understand um, how we might develop new therapies. So to do that, you need, if you want to grow the organism and study it in a lab, you need what's called a biosafety level three or a BSL-3 lab. And these are images from a BSL-3. So this is the kind of precautions you'd have to take to study COVID or any other aerosolized pathogen that people um, get when they inhale infectious particles. So you can see that the lab is specially negative pressurized and we wear Tyvek suits and all of the work happens inside of a laminar flow hood. So there's a lot of precautions that you have to take to, to study this organism in the lab. And OSU has a BSL-3 uh, and we're working on plans to renovate the BSL-3. So it's kind of a plan that's in transition. In the future, I'm hoping that uh, we'll have the opportunity to study coxie in the wet lab. But for the meantime, what we're doing is using computational approach or population genomics um, to study coccidioides. So we use this approach called GWAS. I'm gonna to explain to you in just a second. But essentially the idea is that we can get genome sequences from many individuals in the population and understand how the genetic diversity of these organisms is contributing to some of its potential virulence traits. 
So I've remade the life cycle here. You can see the filamentous phase and the spores are in the environment. Then they go into the human body. But I want to redirect your attention to this lower portion where I've illustrated some of the environmental stresses that this organism has to withstand. You know, think about living in the soil in the desert, how much UV, drying out, salt spray, you would have to um, essentially be able to live through to go on and complete your life cycle. And my thought is I'd like to connect these environmental variables with clinical variables. So many organisms will um, evolve the the production of pigments like melanin to protect themselves and fungi use those same pigments in their cell walls to evade detection by the human immune system. So we're trying to understand the genes behind some of the traits that make these fungi virulent in the clinic by getting a handle on how much genetic diversity is in these populations in the wild and how that is related to some of their virulence traits. And to do that, we're using this method called GWAS. And GWAS is essentially um, a population-wide genome sequencing approach. So, it, so the acronym is Genome-Wide Association Studies. And the logic is this. If we wanted to know how, for example, a human disease uh, was functioning or transmitted between generations, we could make a family tree of individuals and say, OK, we know that this disease has a genetic basis because it's inherited through generations. And then if we get the genome sequences of each of these individuals, so in this example, one individual is a line of sequence. We note that only the purple individuals have this C at this locus. And so this is the, the nuts and bolts of GWAS is that we essentially are correlating genotype and phenotype. And if we take that correlation and forget about the um, relationship between the generations, we can just visualize those data. So we essentially ask across the genome, where are these SNPs or variant loci and how are they correlated with a phenotype? So this, if you remember your statistics course is just like a t-test and uh, any statistical test has a p-value. You essentially are looking at statistically significant correlations of these genotypes or SNPs across the genome in this population, how they're correlated with a phenotype. So you can use this approach to study anything you want. We're trying to use it here to understand virulence in COXI and the reason that GWAS works is that natural selection has already worked on these populations. These organisms are out in the desert doing things like uh, withstanding UV and, and desiccation. And so the common example that's a little more familiar is um, the rise of antibiotic resistance. So if we have a population of bacteria that's mostly uh, sensitive to antibiotics, that's represented by the red dots, and we have a few individuals that have genes to resist um, antibiotics, the pink dots, then we apply antibiotics, we're going to end up with a colony that's mostly antibiotic resistance. So in other words, the proportion of genetic differentiation in this population has shifted. You have more pink than red after you apply this selective pressure. And it's the exact same idea that we're looking at in GWAS and COXI. We're asking, what are the genes that allow these fungi to um, do things like survive in the face of radiation that then also allow them to live in the human body? And we're doing that by looking at a, a clinical population from Arizona. So I told you that the, um, the valley fever phenomenon is centered in Southern uh, California and Arizona. We have this clinical population from Pima County <clears throat> that's been provided to us by Dr. Bridget Barker at Northern Arizona University. And we essentially take these isolates into the BSL-3 and note the degree of pigmentation. So you can see these are all the same species of fungus. Each individual is a, a novel isolate. And you can see how much they vary in their pigmentation from very light to very dark. And so essentially what we do is get a genome sequence for each individual and then ask, here's the distribution of phenotypes in the population or pigmentation. <clears throat> and then here's the distribution of genotypes. So in this in this chart, you have a locus is a row and the individual is um, a column. So this individual has a G at this base. You essentially walk down this table and ask how correlated are these genotypes and phenotypes. The end result, and this is just an example, just a piece of cartoon data, are going to be loci that are correlated with whatever phenotype you screen for. So in our case, we're looking for, again, those virulence genes in, in coccidioides populations. And they're going to pop right out on these Manhattan plots or these graphs, looking at, again, the um, phenotypes that are correlated with genetic variants. 
So if you're interested in, in learning programming skills, you want to learn more about Valley Fever or computational genomics, I encourage you to check out a new course that I'm developing that's going to be taught this spring. It will be taught remotely. It's cross-listed in botany and BDS at OSU as um, a bird division undergrad and also grad course. And um, don't let any, any uh, skills be a barrier. It's a chance to learn computational tools, programming, Unix, Python, R, and it's focused on valley fever. So if you're interested in learning any sort of evolutionary approaches or how to uh, work with computational data, check this course out. It'll be offered every spring. So I'm going to transition now to the second half of the talk, which is about fungal bacterial interactions. And it's focused on this angle on the on the fungal microbiome or these uh, fungal endosymbionts. <clears throat> so these are the fungi I'm going to talk about today are plant associated. They're all isolated from the roots of poplar trees. And that's what you're seeing on the left is a poplar tree. So the work is supported uh, historically by the Department of Energy and they're very interested in poplar trees because that's where all of our paper and cardboard pulp comes from. And it's also a source of um, alternative energy research. So we know that plants have a lot of fungi and bacteria that interact with them directly. But what we know less about and what um, I'm interested in is this this side of the triangle, the fungal bacterial interactions. So if you were to dig up a root of this poplar tree, you would see something like this. This is a, a scanning electron micrograph of a root that's been cross-sectioned. So you're looking at kind of like you cut a, a sub sandwich in half and you're looking at it face on. This is uh, plant tissue is color coded from purple inwards. And then the red is all fungal tissue or hyphae, these filamentous cells that have wrapped around this plant root. I've illustrated one here, but in reality, there's a whole community of fungi and bacteria just waiting to interact around these plant roots or in this area called the rhizosphere. But the complexity doesn't stop there. So if you looked inside of a fungal cell, and that's what I'm showing you here, this long structure is a fungal filament or a hypha, you would see that there are actually bacteria. These little jelly beans are bacteria living inside of these fungal cells. And then you can get the genome sequence of both the fungi and the bacteria. We use genomics quite a bit as a tool in my lab. Um, you would see that the bacteria actually have places where viruses or phages have came and attacked those bacteria and left little pieces of their tails or DNA signatures. So this is wild. This is like a Russian nested doll. You have a plant root wrapped up by a fungus with bacteria inside, with viruses inside the bacteria. Where does the complexity end? And what this system really offers us is the opportunity to ask this question that really drives research in lab, and that's how do symbioses evolve? So we're going to take a close look at one fungus and its endosymbiont and take it apart with genomics data and figure out what these two are doing for each other and how long they've been interacting. But I just wanted to say a quick word about the ubiquity of fungal endosymbionts in the kingdom. So if you, fungal endosymbiosis is a, a new field. We're just beginning to understand these interactions and, and appreciate that fungi have bacteria living inside of their cells at all. But if we ask the question, which fungi in the kingdom have these endosymbionts, and we turn to the scientific literature, excuse me, we find that many, almost all of the fungal groups that we know about have bacterial endosymbionts of some flavor. So that's what I'm showing you here is an overview of the literature where I've put a family tree of all the fungi in the middle and it's color coded. So the red are ascomycetes like saccharomyces, the budding yeast, the green are basidiomyces. These are your mushroom forming fungi. And then we have a few earlier diverging groups here. So the dots along the outside are telling you which bacteria associate with these fungi. And there's a couple takeaways. One is that, like I was saying, almost every group has endosymbionts. And two is that the endosymbionts themselves are pretty diverse. We get a lot of different proteobacteria, actinomycetes, and firmicutes. And there seem to be some patterns emerging. You know, we need more data to really assess that in a robust way. But uh, what we can be certain about is that these endosymbionts as a phenomenon are fairly widespread and underappreciated. And that groups like the mucoromycota, which is what I'm going to talk about today, have a really special relationship with bacteria and endosymbionts that live inside of their cells. So let's narrow in on the mucoromycota fungi. This is another depiction of the fungal tree of life. 
And the way that we read these phylogenies is um, just like a regular tree, the trunk is the oldest and the leaves or the branches um, are very closely related individuals. So the closer a leaf is together, the more closely related they are. So when, when I say I'm a mycologist or we think about mycology, a lot of people just immediately go mushrooms and that's not untrue. But this green box, these basidiomycota fungi, these are the mushroom forming fungi. And you'll notice that it's a very, actually a very small proportion of the diversity in the kingdom. So you've got your basidiomycetes here, your ascomycetes here, that's saccharomyces, the budding yeast. If you like beer or wine or bread, that's, that's the fungus that's in charge. <clears throat> it's also a genetic model organism, so we know a lot about fungal genetics, and we'll return to that um, at the end of the talk because of work in this, this model organism in Saccharomyces. So together, we have our two youngest crown groups, the Asco and Basidiomycetes, but this is the group that I want to talk about today, the Zygomycetes, and it's a really fun group to work in because it, it's... Um, you know, we don't know a lot about these fungi. We're barely getting genome sequenced and they have a, a ton of really cool ecologies. So I know that you've seen these uh, fungi before. These are the kinds of things that will crop up on your breads and your strawberries if you leave them in the fridge too long. Some of them attack insects or are used to produce things like tempeh. Really cool group of fungi, but we're gonna narrow in even further here on the mucoromycota. So this is the group that I was telling you about that have really special uh, relationships with bacteria. And the fungus that I'm gonna talk the most about today is called Morturiella elongata, and it's here in the yellow box. And it belongs to this group, the mucoromycota that's in the green box. And this group is really quite special because it all of the major genera in this group um, have notoriously, are notoriously inhabited by endosymbionts that belong to the beta proteobacteria. So these are very close relatives of Burkholderia. Um, so again, the star of the show today, the fungal host is Morturiella elongata and its endosymbiont is Mycoavidus. So if you hear me say Mycoavidus, that's the endosymbiont and Morturiella is the fungal host. But there's this really cool pattern that happens where mucoromycota fungi have beta proteobacterial endosymbionts. And the reason is because there was an ancient infection event so if we roll the clock way, way back 300, 400 million years ago, before these fungi had a chance to diversify, what we're detecting is that the common ancestor of this group was infected by the common ancestor of this group. And therefore, every time they divided or speciated, they took their bacterial endosymbionts or their bacterial microbiome with them. And the way that that event has um, propagated or the way it looks today is this coevolutionary pattern. So if we make these family trees or phylogenies of these groups, what we find is that the uh, mucoromycota often have beta proteal bacterial endosymbionts. And if you make trees of those two groups and point them at each other, you see not only that the shapes of those trees match, but also that the some of the branch lengths, which um, depict mutation rates or time also match. And so another way of saying that is that this um, interaction or symbiosis is very old. In fact, we estimate uh, over 300 million years old. And this this phenomenon is specialized to this group of fungi and bacteria. So about Morturiella and Mycoavidus, what do they do for each other? One of the key findings that we made a few years back is that Mycoavidus, this endosymbiont or these endosymbiotic bacteria, really relies heavily on Morturiella lipids. So Morturiella makes a ton of lipids and fatty acids and they're actually billion dollar industries centered on growing these fungi and harvesting these products for things like making weight gain formulas and supplementing baby formulas. And the fatty acids themselves are really nutritious things like arachidonic acid and linoleic acid, very, very healthy fatty acids that the fungus can use for its own purposes, but that it also shares with it, its endosymbiotic bacteria. And we know that from looking at the genes, the functional genes in the bacteria, but also from a number of physiological assays. So whatever they eat when they're present, they leave behind once they're cleared. So we use an antibiotic clearing to get rid of these endosymbionts. And we see that these fatty acids that they feed on um, accumulate. And that's what you're seeing in the culture. So this is the same fungus. This one has endosymbionts. This one does not. Look at all those extra lipids and fatty acids. 
<coughs> excuse me. The other piece of evidence that we have for this is that oftentimes these bacteria are clustered around these lipid bodies or droplets when we see them in images. So this is takeaway number two. <coughs> what does mycoavidus eat? It eats fatty acids from its fungal host from Morteriella. We can see genetic evidence of this interaction in the genomes of these two microbes. So when we grow micro or sorry, Morteriella in lab, these fungi on plates, uh, you also are growing the bacteria inside of the cells. And when you extract DNA from the whole system, you can actually use that DNA to assemble the genomes of both microbes simultaneously. And that's what I'm showing you here. So you get back uh, fungal contigs or pieces of fungal genomes, and that's what you see on the top. And you also get back bacterial DNA that you can use to build the bacterial genome. And when you do and you take a look at that genome and ask which genes are inside, you can see that the, the bacterial genome actually is specialized on these fatty acids. <clears throat> that Morteriella has. And so in many ways, this bacterial genome isn't a ton different than other bacteria, but one uh, special way that it is, is that it's highly reduced. So living inside of a fungal cell has essentially been a use it or lose it situation for these, uh, these endosymbionts or the fungal microbiome. And we know this because we can compare the endosymbiont genome content to its closest relatives. So here we have the beta proteobacteria. These are free living bacteria. They can live on their own and go about their business. These are uh, facultative endosymbionts. They can kind of come into fungal cells and then leave when they please. And these are the obligate endosymbionts. That's where mycoavidus is. And what we see is that when we compare genome size and content across this gradient, um, so we can kind of leverage this gradient to ask, okay, any endosymbiont was once free living, what are the changes that happened along the way? And what we see when we compare the genome size and, and content across that gradient is that the genome really shrinks. It gets a lot smaller as these bacteria transition from free living to facultative to obligate endosymbiosis. You can see, <coughs> excuse me, that the size of their genome gets really quite a bit smaller and also that the functional content shifts appreciably. So these uh, slices of the pie or our kegs, there it's a functional gene annotation where you can imagine, okay, protein degradation. It's a very small percentage of this genome, but it's actually a complete quarter of this genome over here. So one of the questions that we ask is, you know, how has this symbiosis shaped the genomes of the organisms involved? And on the endosymbiont side, the answer is shrinkage. They just basically lose things they no longer need. And it's kind of beautiful, actually. They interweave their functional capacity. So anything they get from their host, they no longer need to keep in their genome and they just start losing genes left and right. And that's the reason that they can't live alone any longer. They've lost things that they need to live alone. So to continue on that thought, um, I just want to show you the functional capacity of these bacteria in a diagram form. So this square box is supposed to be a bacterial cell. It's got all sorts of transporters along the outside. And then on the inside, we have some aspects of primary and secondary metabolism that are illustrated. And um, to get into this gene loss idea, basically any pathway or product that has been impacted by gene inactivation or gene loss, I've colored in blue. And I just want to point out a couple of patterns here. So the first is nearly one third of the amino acids here um, are missing and you need amino acids to build proteins to live alone. So if we're interested in the question, what does this endosymbiont get from its host? Uh, these amino acids are one of the uh, smoking gun things that it gets from its host, and we can confirm these hypotheses by checking out the transporters. So here's an example, histidine, missing from the genome, histidine, transporter in the membrane. So remember that these bacteria are living inside of the fungal cells, and anything that they can't make for themselves, they likely get from their host, but they have to have a transporter for it. So we've used this logic to understand what these two are sharing. And the short answer is they're doing um, food trades, right? These bacteria are living on uh, fatty acids that their hosts give them. They're bringing in um, amino acids that their hosts give them. But there's another interesting pattern here that I wanna point out. And it's that glycolysis or the derivation of energy from sugars is also um, abridged in several places. 
And the end, end of glycolysis, if you remember, is acetyl-CoA, which you really need for the whole cell to function. Like if you can't make acetyl-CoA, you're completely done. Where does it come from? Instead, it comes from the breakdown of fatty acids. So we already saw that fatty acids accumulate in cleared isolates. And even in this reduced genome, we have multiple copies of enzymes in this pathway plus importers. So we've used this logic to kind of build a story about what these two are doing for each other. And, and one of the um, things that became obvious to us in the beginning <clears throat> was that they're essentially sharing lunch. They're feeding each other and eating each other's byproducts. So we've leveraged this clearing approach that I keep mentioning, and it's essentially, we put these fungi on antibiotics. I think this is pretty cool. These are the same kinds of drugs that you would take if you were sick, um, just antibiotics with different mechanisms. And we passage these tissues back and forth from solid to liquid media until we get a negative result with this PCR assay that we have. So the idea here is that we can just use gene sequencing to detect the presence of these bacteria and confirm when we have a cleared isolate. And so once we generate these lines of fungi, some with bacteria in their cells and some without, we can use them in comparative assays and ask how, how do these um, endosymbionts or the bacterial microbiome, how does it affect the behavior of, of their fungal hosts? And the short answer is it, it affects them quite a bit. So this is the exact same fungus with the same genome here the endosymbionts are present, here they're absent, they look different, they smell different, they grow differently, so we can measure the rates of these colonies over time and watch them. And we've figured out that they're, that's partially because of the sharing of those resources we already talked about, the amino acids and fatty acids. But one question that remains, and here's where I'm gonna transition to what lab is currently working on and what we hope to do in the future, is kind of, what do these endosymbionts do to their hosts? So we know that they eat fatty acids and amino acids and that when they're gone, the fungi seem to do better, but what are the endosymbionts giving back or how do these endosymbionts affect their hosts? And one of the ways that's actually quite profound is that these endosymbionts seem to control the mating patterns of their hosts. So if we take two isolates in the same species and plate them on media, um, we can, we can monitor whether or not that they have sex or do sexual reproduction based on the production of these zygospores or these golden spores with the thick walls with disease next to them. And there's this interesting pattern that emerges where cleared isolates, here's the B minus, that's for cleared. Cleared isolates mate way more than the wild type isolates. So in other words, these endosymbionts seem to have gained control of their, abil of their host ability to mate. This is not unlike your skin microbiome, putting off volatiles that dictate who you want to mate with. There's a lot of commonalities in eukaryotic systems. And this pattern is present in this larger group of fungi in the mucoromycota and the beta proteobacteria. So you remember I told you that this whole group of fungi has these very intimate relationships with this group of bacteria. So we can take examples from other pairs, like other fungi with other uh, beta proteobacterial endosymbionts. And um, our colleague, Stephen Mondo, published this very interesting paper where he showed in Rhizopus, which is another mucoromycota fungus, the exact same pattern. But you'll notice that here it's opposite. When you clear these fungi of their endosymbionts, you actually abolish mating, you get rid of mating. So here we have a larger pattern in the group where not only do uh, relatives of fungi house relatives of bacteria, those bacteria somehow got their hands on the mating switch, but the pattern is really different in different groups. In some groups, you get rid of the microbiome and they mate more. In some groups, you get rid of the microbiome and they just stop mating. So this is one of our active research questions is how and why do endosymbionts control fungal mating? And to answer this question, the tool that we're using is comparative transcriptomics. We're profiling gene expression. So if you remember the central dogma, DNA turns into RNA, turns into protein. We're looking at the RNA level and counting um, messenger RNAs in different conditions. And this is a bioinformatics pipeline that tells you about different file types and programs and you can learn more about this if you take my population genomics course. But the main point at the bottom here is 
this uh, annotation phase where we essentially are adding function to the story. So you can use transcriptomics or genomics or any sort of omics you want, but if you uh, work in the early diverging fungi and the mucoromycota group, one of the joys and also challenges is that we just, we don't really know much about these fungi. So we don't have good um, annotations or predictions of gene function. And to get around that, what we do is a little trick where we compare genes that we know um, the function of, like Saccharomyces genes, for example, with the gene content of uh, Morteriella. And we can assign orthologs and say, okay, here's some genes that are of, of suspect for whatever reason. And in Saccharomyces, they do X. So therefore we can build hypotheses about their gene function. So that's what we did. We called orthologs in Saccharomyces and then when we take a bird's eye view at these data, what we see is that we have a couple patterns emerging. So this pie chart is just showing you which genes are differentially expressed in the cleared isolates. It's a very simple experiment. Endosymbiont present, endosymbiont absent, what kinds of genes are changing in their abundance? And the first two classes that we see are lipid and carbohydrate metabolism, which is somewhat comforting because uh, of all the previous work that we've done, we know that lipids and amino acids and things are very important. And then the third class, this response to chemicals, this ends up being genes that are involved in mating in Saccharomyces. So here I'm showing you a, a schematic of the genes that are differentially expressed in the cleared isolate and their fold change. And suffice it to say, these gene names, these are all genes in Saccharomyces that are involved in mating. Um, but what does that mean for Morteriella? So we have this implication of, of genes that are involved in mating in another fungus. Well, let me take a step back and tell you how Saccharomyces actually senses its partners and, and initiates the mating process. So if you've never seen SAC, this is what it looks like. It's a budding yeast. Um, and when one Saccharomyces gets near another Saccharomyces, uh, they evaluate how close they are and whether or not they're uh, mating compatible by um, exuding these hormones. So they smell each other's hormones, just like us. And in, in Saccharomyces, they do that with a set of receptors called GPCRs, and those are depicted as these little field goals here, and then pheromones. And so this receptor is for this pheromone, and the opposite is also true. So they secrete these peptide-based pheromones and GPCRs, and the genes that are involved in that process are those that we detected in Morteria in the cleared isolate compared to its wild-type counterpart. But that's really strange because if you remember the, the fungal family tree, those two fungi are not very closely related at all. And the closest relatives of Morteriella that we know of use uh, trisporic acid intermediates um, as a molecule rather than peptides in the GPCR route. They are using a completely different chemical. So this is a, a fungal life cycle where um, we have these sexual spores or zygospores, and you remember seeing those in the images on the plates. Um, so they produce these when two isolates sense each other, but they use a completely different chemical. And Morteriella is a very strange individual because it doesn't have the genes to make this chemical. So in other words, here's our fungal tree of life again. We have these younger groups, the Asco and Basidio mycota, that are using peptide-based pheromones and these GPCRs or these uh, transmembrane sensors. And then there's this older school method of using trisporic acid intermediates that happens in some of the earlier diverging fungi, but we don't really know how Morteriella uh, senses its mating partners. It doesn't have the genes to do this. It appears like endosymbionts are affecting some aspect of this process. And so the open questions that we're working on right now are, how do endosymbionts affect this process and how does this process happen at all? We're interested in how Morteriella senses its mating partners. And then lastly, um, we want to look at population genetics in Morteriella uh, isolate. So we've collected populations on various spatial scales, some from right here around Corvallis, some from up and down the West Coast, and we are, are baiting from soils. So we have a special method that we use to get these fungi out of soils using crab shells. These fungi have um, enzymes for breaking down chitin, so you can use any chitin rich, like a shrimp skin or a crab shell or anything to get them into pure culture, which is what you're seeing here. And the hypothesis rests on that mating um, manipulation observation. So if about 
half of these isolates have endosymbionts and the endosymbionts control whether or not they can mate or undergo meiotic recombination, then the prediction is that about half of the population will be really outcrossed and very diverse and the other half will essentially look asexual. So we're uh, rapidly sequencing genomes of cultures in lab right now um, to try to assess this population genomics uh, question. I also wanted to give a plug for mycology. I teach mycology in the fall. It's three credits. Uh, we have a lot of fun. This year it was online, but usually we take a ton of field trips and you should consider taking mycology if you're at OSU or if you're interested. I think they also have an e-campus version. Um, want to say thanks to my lab. We're always looking for undergraduate researchers. So if you are interested in this work, drop me an email. I have a ton of um, really helpful and awesome collaborators who helped out with the uh, published research that I presented today. And then I just wanted to, whoops, say, oh, thank you for your attention. Um, these are the my Twitter, the lab Twitter, our, our lab websites, and then there's my email address. If you want to get a hold of me, I welcome you to do so. And I thank you for your attention. I'm going to stop my screen share now. Um, and I welcome your questions. Great. Thank you very much, Jesse. Really appreciate the talk. Um, yeah, we got some clapping emojis in the <laughs> on the screen, but uh, yeah, let's get going with a few uh, questions. It looks like um, just to start off the top, we have a couple related to um, valley fever. Uh, so Kelsey asked just first, uh, are animals more prone in getting fungal infections like valley fever because they are low to the ground? That's a great question. So, um, you know, valley fever affects mammals of all stripes. I've seen reports of valley fever in um, captive sea mammals, so things like dolphins um, and whales that wash up have valley fever infections, but we do see more valley fever infections in burrowing mammals. So anything that's going to be digging through the soil and kicking up uh, a lot of dust and breathing in dust, like armadillos, one way that we get um, valley fever isolates from soils is actually by collecting soil from around rodent middens. So when rodents go burrowing and making their homes in soil, you can um, collect the soil with the fungi in it from around where they come out and where they poop and pee. Those nitrogen rich depositions oftentimes will support a lot of fungal growth. And that's one way to get isolates from the environment. Very good. Um, next, we have uh, another valley fever related question uh, from Jenna. What impacts would we expect to see with respect to fungal infections due to organ wildfires and climate change? That's another great one. So uh, valley fever infection rates will spike every time soil is exposed. And, and that could be because of wildfires. It could be because of landslides after things like wildfires and clear cutting. Um, Basically anything that uh, exposes the soil and also heats and dries the soil in a significant way can promote valley fever growth. So, um, you know, I'm kind of biased, but I think this is one of the more disturbing side effects of climate change that we should be paying more attention to is the emergence of things like valley fever. Tara asked a really good question related to just, just more of a general uh, idea. Do you have any recommendations of books or for a general audience, social media accounts, podcasts, anything like that for people who might be interested in learning a little bit more about the world of fungi? Yeah. Um, if you're interested in learning how to identify fungi, um, Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast is a really recent book. It is uh, centered on Northern California's mushroom diversity, but a lot of it is overlapping with Oregon. That's a great one by uh, Noah Siegel and Christian Schwartz. Um, Paul Stamets of Fungi Perfect Die has a lot of cool um, books on, on the intersection of mycology and, and how fungi are being used for various applications like bioremediation. And um, he also has some books on how to grow fungi. Um, there are some really fun Facebook groups 
that uh, specialize in regional fungal diversity. So once the mushrooms start popping up in Oregon, you can see what people are finding and um, therefore know what to look out for and also get your mushrooms ID'd by a community. Um, those I would suggest following. And then iNaturalist, if you know the app iNaturalist, it's really cool. It's a AI based um, app where you can take images of not only fungi, plants, insects, animals, but the mushrooms uh, are probably the coolest. You take images of what you find and it will guess what it is and make a suggestion. And then, you know, there's communities of people with various levels of training that can confirm your identifications or help you find resources. So those would be my suggestions. I love iNaturalist. I use that a lot. Sometimes I'll just be bored and want to say, hey, I wonder what's kind of going on in Central Oregon or, you know, Coos Bay or just wherever. What's, you know, what kind of stuff would I find around there? So that's, I really love that, um, that app. Um, the next one is from Jenna again. Do you consider fungus to be a plant, animal, or something, something in between? Definitely something in between. So fungi have their entire own kingdom. Um, we used to think that fungi were plants and they are plant-like in the sense that they don't move around like animals do, um, but they're also animal-like. So the plants, of course, are, are photoautotrophic. They make their own uh, food sources from sunlight and from carbon dioxide through photosynthesis and, and fungi don't do that. Um, they Instead, they exude enzymes and, and suck up the nutrients that those enzymes break down. So just like your stomach, in some ways you're an inside out mushroom. You put food into a chamber and then you exude enzymes onto it and, and suck up the nutrients that come out. And that's how fungi also eat. I was actually um, just kind of curious personally, um, if for anyone, I'm sure there are a few people that are in this, um, in the Zoom call that may be interested in a similar career path that you've taken. Do you have any recommendations for those people? Any, any pathways or, or um, ideas that they could have? Yeah, well, you're at the right place. Um, at some universities, you know, you would have one mycologist that would be the mycologist. And we have probably 10 different professors thinking about and studying various aspects of fungal biology or ecology or diversity or using fungi as a genetic model organisms. So OSU is definitely a hub for mycological research. Um, so that's, that's a great start. Um, Otherwise, I would say getting involved with some of the student groups. So the Mycological Society of America has a really active student section and they put on fun events and um, also offer scholarships and fellowships to do things like go to their annual research conferences. They can connect you with uh, peers who are studying similar things or mentors. Um, I would say use every opportunity you can to network with the mycological community. We're fairly small and uh, I think most mycologists are pretty cool and nice. So um, just get yourself plugged in. It's an excellent time to be interested in fungi, isn't it? Fungi are really having a moment um, in our society right now. That's great, thank you. Uh, it looks like Kevin Espinoza, um, in response to Tara's question, recommended the book Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake. So that's another I'm sure that's another really good resource. Uh, the next question, Abby Willis um, wanted to go back to Valley Fever a little bit. And she asked, could you tell us more about the research you want to do in Eastern Oregon about the Valley, fun about, about the valley Fever? Yeah, so, um, you know, my hypothesis is based on uh, where Valley Fever is. One of the open questions is, is it in Eastern Oregon? And we think probably because of the various climate, you know, the aspects of the climate that are really similar to uh, desert soils in Southern California and things. Um, and the fact that we found that little Southern Washington blip on the map um, so I think that the habitat is right for coxie there. So that would be one goal is to hopefully find uh, an isolate from Oregon that we can let the Center for Disease Control know and let the research community know that this fungus is um, distributions a little larger than we currently appreciate. That would be one, 
one aspect of future research. And then the other would be using that GWAS approach or the, the genome sequencing at the population level to try to understand virulence traits like pigment production um, or like the production of the various spores that it needs to make to go through its life cycle. So using evolutionary genomics, genome sequencing to try to understand why these organisms um, transit from the environment to the clinic. You know, they don't come from outer space and usually we don't pay attention to fungi until they're kind of a problem. Like once fungi start infecting humans, we start to really say, okay, why is this happening and how can we control this organism? Um, but the truth is, you know, they have a whole nother life cycle that they've evolved over hundreds of thousands of years in the environment, just responding to whatever environmental variables are there and eating whatever they can that have likely shaped the same traits that allow them to then infect human bodies or animal bodies. So trying to make connections between the environment and, and the clinical status of some of these fungi. Great. Shannon had a specific question. Uh, thinking about your research using chitin or crab shells, how do you source the shells? And why did you choose crab shells over, over others such as shrimp? <laughs> That's a great question. You could use shrimp if you want. Some people use shrimp. You could box your shrimp up to go um, and boil them, or, or you could use anything really. One time I was doing field work in the rainforest and I didn't have enough uh, material, so I actually boiled the wings of a cicada exoskeleton that I found, and that works fine. Like any insect or, you know, uh, sea critter exoskeleton will work just fine. The reason we use crab shells is because you can get a big bag of them for relatively cheap at a garden supply store. So they make products that are chitin rich to uh, enrich soils. You can sprinkle across your soil. Um, and it helps promote microbial growth that's beneficial for the plant. So we can get big bags of crushed crab shells for relatively cheap and then sterilize them with the autoclave. So ease is the main reason, but you could, you know, you're smart. You could use any chitin rich bait that you have or that you want to. You could experiment and see if different baits will give different species. Great. Uh, Luis says, thanks for the talk. Luis, thank you for uh, joining us to, uh, this evening. We're so grateful that you could listen in. Uh, Luis had the question, have you done any research on bioluminescent fungi? Uh, are there any that grow locally? That's a really interesting question. Yeah, that is an interesting question. I have not personally studied bioluminescence in fungi. Um, I know that some species of the genus Omphalotus or the laughing mushroom um, are supposed to glow. And I know that there are some Omphalotus species that are abundant locally, but I, I have yet to see bioluminescent fungi in Oregon. Um, that's a good one. I was also um, kind of curious what originally got you interested in a career studying mycology. I'm sure that is a great story. Yeah, well, uh, having grown up in Idaho, I, you know, I definitely knew that I wanted to study some aspect of the um, of the wild world, whether it be plants or fungi. Um, and then I would say. Uh, really excellent mentors. I took some mycology classes as an undergrad with uh, instructors who just were endlessly enthusiastic. When they talked about fungi and about mycology, you could just feel their passion. Um, and they also were excellent in the sense that they took time to work with students and to involve them in research. And I think when I, when I realized that I, as a student, could really contribute to doing things like going to the rainforest and finding new species and describing them, putting a name to something that we've never, you know, formally documented uh, before. It, that flipped a switch for me. It, it seemed like a way to merge uh, a passion that I'd always have with also with a way to give back and, you know, do research on fungi that have a potential positive or negative impact on society. It just felt like all of those things kind of collided to a calling. That's really cool. We actually had a email come in before this lecture series. And uh, this person asked, I have learned that Winthrow aided by fungal rot is a primary forest disturbance in Southeast Alaska. I have also spent the last few years keying mushrooms new to me. I'm looking now 
for ideas um, for field research or data gathering to learn about more fungi. Do you have any suggestions or ideas? Yeah, well, that's that's very astute. Um, there are some fungi that specialize on degrading the root systems of trees. And when they do that, the whole tree becomes destabilized and events like heavy winds and things will just tip an entire tree over. Like I'm sure we've all been walking in the forest and noticed that a tree will be, you know, fallen, but it's either snapped in the middle like this or completely fallen over and the roots and everything came with it. And, and that's what they're referring to is when the roots rot and the whole tree tips up. And that happens here too. It happens a lot of places. Those root rotters are pretty common. Um, as far as ways to get involved, I would check out probably forestry um, in terms of professors or researchers that are thinking about how forest pathogens affect tree health or stand dynamics. Um, Jared Laboldis is another professor in botany and plant pathology who, who um, is interested in native forest pathogens that you might get a hold of. There's definitely, definitely interest in understanding those organisms and jobs in, in the government and the um, forestry department that probably would be of interest. Great, thank you. I took Jared's class uh, in the fall and I really, really enjoyed that forest pathology class. It looks like we have time for one more. So uh, Forrest asked, do you think genom genomics, I, I think I'm pronouncing that right, hopefully, is going to be very important in the field or is that more niche? I do think it's gonna be really important in the field. I think genomics is gonna be important for pretty much every field. So if you think about services like 23andMe, how much they've revolutionized what we know about our history, our ancestors, and also our propensity in the future to get various diseases or have food allergies or things like that, the same kinds of concepts apply to fungi. So, um, and the cost of sequencing genomes. So it used to be that, um, we didn't have a ton of genomes because they were super expensive and hard to assemble and things like we didn't really have the computers and the software to deal with the data. But now all of that is becoming very easy and straightforward and very cheap. And I predict that the volume of, of genome data and mycology um, in all fields, but especially in mycology is only going to increase and uh, that those data, those large genome data sets are going to be really important for asking all of the questions that we're interested in. Um, so I think right now, I think we're in a transition right now, the, um, the skill sets to do genomics are maybe a little bit abstract, but I think that it's going to become a pretty core part of the curriculum of, of college and even high school and K-6 education, learning to program and to think about uh, how genomes work and, and how that's related to functionality of all organisms, but especially fungi. Great, thank you very much, Jesse. I think that's all the questions that we have for tonight. Uh, so we just all wanna give you um, a big thank you for um, being here tonight. We're so grateful that, that you could join us and um, just for everyone else that, that you could join and, and listen to Jesse's um, lecture. Uh, just want to give a quick plug. Next month, April 5th, we're going to have our second lecture in the series. And that's going to be more focused on the human value of fungus, specifically psilocybin assisted therapy. Um, so once again, Jesse, thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all next month, April 5th, for the next lecture. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse.